Okay. Interesting. Yep. So, uh, 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 Ethiopian coffee is better than Brazilian, and I thought Brazil is. Uh... I, oh, Brazilian is wonderful, but the first cup made all the difference. And now I get whatever kind I have, and it's usually some kind of espresso. See, my cup says I'm allergic to mornings. <laughs> Without coffee, I have no personality. Uh, yes, coffee like uh, makes people think it's uh, make it's them amazing, and it's healthy. It's very good for you. It prevents dementia. Yes, it prevents yes. mental degeneration. It's one of the only things that does it. Good. Dementia is a common problem, actually. Oh, yes, I know. I know all about it. Yeah, it runs. My father had it. My uncle had it. All the men in my family had it, starting at age 75. All of them. Uh, do you think reading can, can, can help this? Uh... They say that. They say that. I don't really know the research. Uh, I've, I've heard that stories can help you. I, I don't know. But the only thing I found in the research that really works consistently is coffee. It eliminates the bad chemicals in the arteries in the brain. Yes, yes. But it, it makes you awake all the time. That's one of the... Not me. It just makes me normal. It doesn't make me awake. Just fine. It's perfect for me. If... Yes, for if I drink it in the evening, it makes me awake. Uh, no, I, I don't drink it in the evening. No, that's too much. I'm tempting fate if I do that. But it's just right the way I do it. Works for me. Okay, My good. uncle, not genetic, my uncle by marriage, was a brilliant electrical engineer. And he was one of the people who developed uh, FM radio. Absolutely brilliant. He drank 10 cups of coffee a day and was active until he was 102. So that's a good model. Wow. wow. Great. So very happy to see you again. Well, thank you. Good to see you. Yes. yes. How many people do we have? A lot. More than you can imagine. Really? 10, yes. 20, 30? No, more than 1,000. No kidding. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, we received more than 1,000, uh, uh, you know, people who would like to, uh, you know. Oh, that's wonderful. I love it. That's great. Yes. Okay, let's see. Because writing is important for a lot of people. Okay, so I should go for about one hour, is that right? No, we are live now. Pardon? You, we are live, you can, you can start your paper. I can start anytime. Okay, I'm live, yes. I'm drinking coffee, I'm okay. Uh, welcome to the uh, seminar, webinar. The title of my discussion is 17 Secrets of academic writing, and they're all secrets. Not very many people know about this stuff. And I'm going to end with a declaration of war against the publishers who are stealing money from us, in my opinion, and I don't care, all right? It's got to end. Future of our profession is at stake. The reason I like to talk about these things, I haven't done research in these areas. I've been a student of this stuff but it has helped me so much as a scholar. It's made a huge, huge difference. So it's very nice to pass this research along, even though I didn't, I think I wrote one, I did one study on this, this is all, but this is really what I've learned from other people. And let me begin with the secret number one, we'll have 17 secrets, and it's a big surprise to teachers. More writing will not result in better writing. If you assign your students five essays a week, 10 essays, 100 essays, they won't be better in writing. They won't have better style. They won't have better spelling. They won't have better grammar. And this makes sense to me because the work we've done in general says that we acquire language by input, 
not by output. We acquire language when we understand what people tell us and what we read. So this fits in. It's not a surprise. When you increase writing, you don't get better writing. So what does writing do for us? Should we worry about it? Yes. Writing helps us solve problems. Writing makes us smarter. My goodness, is this, this is so correct, it's amazing. I think about this stuff every day, all day when I do my work. It was Peter Elbow, Elbow, E-L-B-O-W, professor on the East Coast in the United States. He said it exactly right. Meaning is what you end up with, not what you start out with when you write, okay? Now the core of writing that makes it so powerful is revision. Revision is the center point of what we call the composing process. Composing process, how to use writing to make yourself smarter, how to avoid writer's block. Here's a number of quotes from writers. In fact, Neil Simon, an American playwright who's written, oh gosh, probably 40, 50 very good plays. Mediocre writers write, good writers rewrite. Simon says, that 90% of his writing day is revision, going over what he did, changing it. Well, the hero of all this is, of course, one of my favorite authors, Kurt Vonnegut, who is a really outstanding fiction writer, but he's also written essays about how he does it. Here's what he says. Writing allows even a stupid person to seem halfway intelligent. If only that person will write the same thought over and over again, improving it just a little bit each time. It's a lot like inflating a blimp, huge balloon with a bicycle pump. Anybody can do it. All it takes is time. That is magnificent in my opinion. The next quote, I have to tell you, I'm gonna read it as it is on the handle. Uh, this is not me talking, this is famous Hemingway. So it's his language, not mine. But this statement has been extremely helpful. The first draft of anything is shit. Don't worry about your first draft being good. It's going to be bad. That's the way it is. Just get it, get it down, and you'll start to make progress. Now, we've been taught in school, and we teach our students, that you should make a plan. You should outline your uh, essay before you start. Good idea, very good idea. Missing from that though is a very important point. Change your plan, keep changing it all the time. Your first draft, your first outline is not the final one. As you write, you'll get new ideas. Um, Peter Elbo says, when you're about one third done with your essay, do a new outline, start all over again. You'll find that writing has made you smarter you'll have new ideas. I remember this happened to me very vividly on a flight. I took long airplane flights. I don't know when we'll ever do that again. Anyway, I was on my way to from California to Hong Kong, where I was going to speak at a conference. And they asked the conference speakers to um, hand in their papers before they spoke. So I had my paper already. I had written the whole thing. And I was ready for this 12 hour flight. And I was just going to relax and watch movies and then it happened. People got on the airplane and the guy sitting, took the seat next to me. I was on the aisle, he was in the middle. He looked like he had just escaped from prison. You know, he had all the tattoos and looked like a tough guy and looked like he had guns in his pocket, you know, very scary looking guy. So I pretended to be very uh, masculine. I said, how you doing there? He sits down. And then he fell asleep on my shoulder. Oh no, no, not for me. So the plane had just taken off. What do I do about this? And I, you know, on all the international flights, there's a place where you can get inter uh, snacks. So you can drink seven up and eat potato chips all the way across the ocean. So I went there and I put my computer down. There was a space and I started to work. Now, my paper was done. I listened to Peter Elbow's voice. I re-outlined the paper all over again. Now, I thought I was finished, 
But as I went through the paper and I made a new outline, I got new ideas. I found places where my thinking was not correct or I made some mistakes, correct them. And I was happy. I was upset that I couldn't hand in my paper and relax on the plane. But part of me was happy because it meant I was learning something new. I rewrote the entire paper. It was real progress, finding my mistakes, okay? So good writers plan, but they're willing to change their plans. Now, the important thing is that as you go over your writing, you find your mistakes. A wonderful quote from Noam Chomsky. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. Yes. My whole <clears throat> life, my whole professional life consists of being wrong most of the time. I find my mistakes when I revise my paper. That's where I make it better and I see that I was wrong. Uh, my son is a, a mathematician and he told me this story about one of his professors when he was in graduate school. So at the University of Texas, a man named John Tate. I got to tell you, John Tate passed away a few years ago. He was in his 90s. He was one of the most famous people in algebra in the world. A man with a wonderful reputation for being brilliant. Many discoveries. Uh, someone asked him in a class how he, um, how he had his work day. What did he do? And he says, I spent 50% of my time working hard and not getting anywhere. Maybe 10% of my time making some progress and 40% of my time wondering how I can be so unproductive 90% of the time. In other words, John Tate, this brilliant algebraicist, thought he wasn't making progress and was worried about it and was blaming himself and felt guilty, um, et cetera. So even this distinguished mathematician, Amy Cohn says here, even smart people struggle and waste time worrying about it, okay? So you can read her article there. Some, here's a Campbell, a um, uh, 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 statistician. Too many potential creators are inhibited by a belief that gifted others solve problems directly. For me, just like other people, uh, most of my time is rewriting. Most of my time is finding mistakes. And rather than thinking I must be stupid, which is what John, State, John Tate did, uh, I realized this is part of the game. This is it. Writing is the best way of clarifying your thinking, no question. Here's uh, Charles Darwin. You know, you know, we all think that you know, brilliant people just, ideas just flow. No, they don't. Charles Darwin, I cannot remember a single first form hypothesis which had not after a time to be given up or greatly modified. Same with me, I write something down. Most of the time it's not correct. Most of the time it needs revision. Um, I've been very interested in the life of Albert Einstein uh, and I was very happy when a book came out, his uh, a biography of Einstein written by Hans Ohanian. Now, I don't know Hans Ohanian, but I know his wife. Uh, we've communicated quite a bit over the years. She's an expert in language arts and writing and reading. It does absolutely wonderful work. And uh, when her husband wrote this book on Einstein, she sent me a copy because she knew I was interested in Einstein. I, I read it. It was wonderful. It's a Terrific book. It's called Einstein's Mistakes, The Human Failings of Genius. I wrote them back and I said, Hans, you made a mistake in your title. Uh, the book is not just Einstein's mistakes. It is the scientific method. It's how all scientists work. It re Kepler quoting reveals the wondrous and twisted roads that lead to knowledge. In the book, there's stories about Einstein. It's also a very good book about Isaac Newton, if you're interested. Einstein would write a paper uh, full of mathematics and formulas. And then a year later, you know, about his theory of relativity, he'd write another article for the same journal and say, last year's paper was wrong. Here are the new equations. This is what it's supposed to be. One year later, he would write another paper, same journal, new equations, last year's paper was wrong. And he did it again, four years in a row. There's Einstein correcting his own work, saying it's wrong, doing it again and again. This is how it's done. 
this is normal. Uh, uh, when I was a graduate student in linguistics many years ago, one of my colleagues, one of the professors had a stamp. He, you know, you write a paper. We didn't have, uh, you know, PDF and all this computer stuff. We just passed our papers around, duplicated them. And uh, he would always put something at the top. This is my latest work. This does not represent my current position because he knew that after two or three days, he'd be changing his mind about something. So this is the way science works. I'm gonna be coming back to this over and over again. Uh, secret number five, rereading. Here's yes. Hemingway. I arise at first light and I start by rereading and editing everything I've written to the point I left off. We never want to do this. You know, we have deadlines, we want to get done. This is a waste of time. When you reread it, you see the progress you've made since you went to bed. Your subconscious mind has been figuring things out for you. We'll come back to that. It's the result of what we'll call incubation, which come too soon. So do take that time and reread what you did the day before. Secret number six. Delay editing. Now, everybody says this, all the experts, and they're all correct, I think. Uh, when you're writing, don't, you're, you're, it's not your final version. Don't worry about spelling. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about punctuation. Don't let it stop you. It's going to interfere with your finding new ideas. Also, the draft you're writing now will probably not be the final one. So you don't want to worry about spelling and punctuation until you do the final draft. Then you can worry about it when you're satisfied this is it. In other words, don't put on your makeup before you take your shower, okay? <laughs> um, this will disturb your thinking, uh, etc. Number seven, incubation. Uh, this comes originally from a book you've never heard of called The Art of Thought. It was, uh, came out in 1926. I was doing a workshop in uh, El Paso, Texas and working in the library. And I took a break and I found this book on the shelf. And I started reading it by Graham, by, by Graham Wallace a long time ago. And it looked absolutely brilliant. Now, I didn't have a library card for that library. And in those days, you, we used something called Xeroxing. You took a coin, put it in the machine, made a copy. I Xeroxed every single page. I got about $10 in nickels and dimes because it looked so interesting. That was a good thing to do, let me tell you. Graham Wallace came up with a, a, a theory of problem solving in various stages. He says, first, you get an idea. And you get that by writing. We'll come back to that as a place where you start. Then you write in order to clarify your thinking. Make sure you've stated the problem. Then he says, take a break. Stop. Don't do anything else creative. Do something stupid that doesn't require your brains. Just uh, put away something, walk around, clean up something, etc. Uh, he says, it requires an interval free from conscious thought to allow the free working of the subconscious mind. This is incubation. Then you go back and you write down your new idea. Then it happens. Uh, a guy named Toll, who wrote a book called um, The Power of Now, said pretty much the same thing. All true artists, now this is not writing theory, this is just creativity stuff. All true artists, whether they know it or not, create from a place of no mind, from inner stillness. Breakthroughs came at a time of mental quietude. That's where ideas come from. So state the problem clearly, struggle with the problem, take a break. I really learned a lot in an article by Poincaré, who was just around the time of Graham Wallace had the same ideas. Poincaré was a mathematician he worked in, uh, he's one of the developers of non-Euclidean geometry. And Einstein was very dependent on his work. In fact, some people felt that Poincaré should have gotten the Nobel Prize for relativity. Actually, Einstein didn't get the Nobel Prize for relativity. He got it for something else, photoelectric effect. That's another story. Uh, anyway, um, 
Poincaré wrote an essay on how he worked, which I have several books that are collections of essays on creativity, and his essay is in every single one of them. Now, this was written in the 1920s. Here's what he says. When I'm working on my math and I get stuck, I have a problem, I can't work it out. I get up from the table and do something that does not require any thinking, okay? I get up from the table and I put some wood on the fire or I wash some dirty dish or something and then come back. For him, it could be 30 seconds, two minutes. The period that you incubate could be, is highly variable. And then when he comes back, the problem is a little bit clearer each time. I have learned to do this. I have learned during writing regular breaks. In fact, many creative people program breaks into their day. Uh, Einstein would go out in his boat for you know, a few minutes at a time or play the violin for a little while. That's dangerous though. I, I don't do that anymore. I used to take a work break by playing the piano. And I find it so much fun to play the piano. I don't want to come back to my work. So I don't do that. I do something that's mindless and not particularly interesting. Tell you a couple of things I do. At my house, I like doing the dishes. I like doing the really? dishes because it's incubation time. Here's how I do the dishes. I can take a task in the kitchen that the ordinary person would finish in 20 minutes it takes me two hours because I use it for incubation. Come into the kitchen, put the computer down, start working immediately. Right away, I get into a writer's block. Right away, there's something I can't quite work out that happens to me all day long. I then go wash a few dishes then come back to the work. By the time the evening is over, my work is done and the kitchen is clean. I do the same thing in hotel rooms. This is kind of a useless strategy now because who knows when we'll ever be in hotel rooms again. Um, I think one of the most boring things in the world to do is unpacking your suitcase. So I use it for incubation. We have all these boring tasks so we can be creative and incubate. I take my computer out. I start working. I first, I reread a paragraph. I see there's the problem. I don't know the answer. I get up, take my suitcase, put it on the bed, open it up. That's all. Then go back to work. I work for another minute, two minutes, another writer's block. I go to my suitcase, take out one shirt and hang it up. It takes a long time, but it really is a good thing to do. By the end of the evening, my work is done and the, you know, the hotel room looks uh, a little bit better. I don't think about unpacking the suitcase. I don't think about doing the dishes. I'm thinking about my work. I'm taking breaks from my work. So these mindless tasks, what does not work for me is alternating between creative tasks. My favorite creative task is to clean up my office, which is never ending, you know, file one paper put one thing away where it goes, um, et cetera. And that's how you get through life. Okay, so inspiration. Here's a big one. Writing is the source of our inspiration. This has helped me more than anything else. You want new ideas? Sit down with pencil and paper, turn on your computer. That's where they're going to come from. Stephen King. Stephen King is probably the world's most productive writer. He you know, writes uh, 10 pages a day or 2000 words, something like that. That's a lot of writing. And <clears throat> here's what he says. Don't wait for the muse. Don't wait for the creative, the creative spirit. Your job is to make sure the muse knows where you're gonna be every day from nine till noon and seven till three. Sit down, start writing, take breaks when you need them, and the creativity will come by itself. Susan Suntag, a good writer. You can't wait for inspiration. Madeline Langle is the best one. Inspiration usually comes during work rather than before it. Now, this 
applies to all the things I do in my life, life that involve uh, creativity. You know, living in California, uh, it, as you all know, especially Los Angeles, it's a requirement that if you live in Southern California, you must be involved in show business. You have to be an actor. You have to be writing a screenplay. You have to be a director, something like that. And everybody I've met here is involved in show business. You know, the waiter tells you, I'm not a waiter. I'm, I'm really an actor. I'll be famous someday and all that. So I've been doing that too. I've been living in Southern California for, for a while. And I've been active in show business, oh gosh, for the last 15 years. And I'm very proud of my accomplishments. I, I write plays. I write musicals. This is my secret life you don't know about. Um, in fact, I've written 10 musicals. They have all been performed. Isn't that wonderful? And there are people come in the audience, more people in the audience than on the stage. It's very nice. I write them from my synagogue, okay? In Judaism, there's a holiday called Purim. Purim takes place in the spring and it's the celebration of the Jewish people overcoming a threat to their existence. All Jewish holidays are like that, by the way. Here's my guide to Jewish holidays. Um, they all have the same plot. Uh, they tried to kill us. We stopped it. Now let's have dinner. I mean, that's the way it is for all of them. <laughs> anyway, this takes place. It's, it's, it's from the, the book of Esther. And in the plot is always the same. Uh, the, there's this king. He's a jerk. He has this beautiful wife. And he wants her, Vashti, he wants her to dance for his friends so he can show off how beautiful his wife is. And she refuses. Now, uh, and then he's, she's banished. According to the Jewish commentary, she's executed. According to the Christian commentary, she's sent into exile. I like that better. So with the permission of my rabbis, I use the Christian commentary on that one. So, and that's really it. And then uh, Esther takes over. She becomes the queen. She wins a beauty contest and she's Jewish and the king didn't know that. And then the, this guy, Haman, wants to kill all the Jews. And she says, I'm Jewish. So she saves her people. That's really what it's about. So it's the same plot. And we try to base it on some movie. Like uh, one year, we did it on Frozen. Okay. And one time, we did it on The Sound of Music and, you know, change the words of the songs. It's really good. Uh, a lot of fun. The cast are the members of the choir. And I'm in the choir. I like being in the choir because... You know, in the Jewish uh, New Year, there's this big holiday, Rosh Hashanah. And then after that, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And, you know, you're there in synagogue for like three days, all day. And if you're in the choir, it's much more interesting. Because the choir director, the cantor, you know, really gets you in the mood for the holidays. You really understand what's going on. So the choir members and I have become good friends over the years. And they're the cast. So the holiday is around March. It's important I'm telling you this. Uh, and I procrastinate. I put it off. Uh, they say, well, Steve, what's what's it going to be this year? I said, I don't know. And the next week, the next week, Steve, come on, we got to get something going. And then I think about Ernest Hemingway. The first yes. draft of anything is shit. That is so helpful. I sit down and I start to write, even though I have no ideas. And I might spend five, 10 minutes doing things and nothing happens. And then the next time it's seven, eight minutes, start get an idea, okay? After a while, after a week, I'm, I'm writing for a half an hour. After two weeks, the draft is done. Then of course, the cantor has me change it. He knows more about show business than I do. Uh, and we, you know, we get it done and the cast makes comments, uh, et cetera. But it's getting to work that does it. These people are right. Madeline Langle, once again, inspiration usually comes during work rather than before it. You don't get ideas by going for a walk in the park. You get ideas by trying to write, get stuck, then go for a walk, come back if you get stuck, etc. cetera. Now, uh, secret number nine is in agreement with this last one, daily regular writing. If you're working on a research project, don't let it go. Work on it, even if it's a little bit every day. It keeps the ideas incubating. It keeps them cooking in your brain. It's wonderful. 
if I'm working on a paper, which I always am, uh, and let's say I go shopping and I'm waiting in line to check out, the person behind me will say something and that will give me an idea for what I'm working on. It's like the world will conspire to help you with your project. If it's on your mind all the time, incubation is happening. Now, that's why writers do regular writing. Uh, Irving Wallace was a fiction writer, but he wrote a paper in a psychology journal uh, and they, he and his colleague interviewed writers, uh, creative writers, scientific writers. Listen to this, the vast majority of authors keep some semblance of regular hours. They go to work, they, it's a job, they go to work and then it happens. Now there are various strategies. Uh, some people are uh, timekeepers, like I'm gonna work for 30 minutes a day. Some people are page counters. I'm gonna do you know, 20 pages a day, five pages. Some people are word counters. I'll tell you what I do and I do it with some hesitation because I don't want you to do what I do just because I do it, okay. Uh, but I'll tell you anyway. Some things will work for you, some things won't. My <clears throat> goal is always 600 words a day. When I'm working on a big project, that's it. I find for me, this is fantastic. If I write 590 words, it feels wrong. I feel incomplete. And the moment I try to write number 601, I can't, I'm stale. There's something magic for me. You'll find it what's right for you. You'll know whether it's pages, time, word counter, um, et cetera. <clears throat> There's a wonderful study by a man named Robert Boyce, taught me a lot. Robert Boyce was a professor, maybe he still is, uh, State University of New York. And he was a professor in the counseling division of his university. And his job, I think this is wonderful. His job was to help junior professors with their research so they would get their research done and they would get tenure at the university, permanent job, which is you know really scary. You don't get tenure, it's really tough. You get it, life is easy. And he found, he interviewed them, talked to them, and he found they were divided into two groups. This just happened naturally. One group of young faculty members had a regular moderate habit of writing. They would write for 40 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, two hours a day. It didn't matter, it always worked. Every single one of them were productive. They got tenure, their writing was acceptable. They got promoted, they didn't lose their jobs and they were more organized during the day. They were prepared for their classes, everything went well. The other group did it wrong. This is about 50-50. He called them binge writers. People who've tried dieting know about the word binge. Let's say you're on a strict diet. We are not supposed to have sugar, okay? Because, you know, you'll gain weight and you're not supposed to have ice cream. So you decide you're gonna be well behaved six days a week, but then on Sunday, you can go to the ice cream shop and have three scoops of chocolate if you want. That's the binge where you let yourself go for one day. The binge writers had this attitude. They didn't write every day. They only write when they only wrote when things were perfect. Say, I can't write unless I have five hours uninterrupted and everything has to be silent. No cars going outside, no airplanes flying overhead. Okay. Uh, everything has to stop. Well, you know the problem with that. That never happens, okay? If you wait for that, you're never gonna write. That's None of these people, pardon? That's a problem. That's the problem. Well, none of these people got any work done because they were waiting for this perfect moment. And then when they sat down to write, they didn't know what they were working on. They had forgotten. They had to reread everything and remember what they were doing, uh, et cetera. It's like having a big ball of string and you can't find the end. They had no idea what they were writing. So they stared at a blank piece of paper or a blank computer screen. If you write every day, you don't lose your place when you sit down the next day, you know where they are. So regular moderate writing 
is a much better idea. Um, Charles Dickens quoted, if he, need, if he missed one day of writing, it took him a week to get back to where he was, a week of hard, hard work to get there. Uh, this is true in other areas. I got a little interested in athletics for a while and how people trained. Um, I, I found an article, which I found just fascinating about marathon runners. How do marathon runners train? The top marathon runners in the world use a technique called LSD, long, slow distance. They ran long time and they took it easy, not as fast as they ran in the race. They didn't overdo it, in other words, and that gave them the absolute best performance. So this may be a general principle, I don't know. Okay, let's move on. Secret number 10, which seems to be a contradiction, but it's not. Where do you get your ideas? Where do you start? Where do you get that first draft? Peter Elbow says, don't sit down and read the whole literature. If you want to do a paper on the influence of ice cream on spelling, don't read the whole influence. Don't read all the papers that have ever been done on it. Write your own ideas first before you read anything. Get an idea of what your thoughts are. Clarify your thinking. Then only read what you must read to solve the problem you're working on now. In other words, don't worry about keeping up with the literature, reading everything. Only read articles in your specialization, your temporary specialization. And you get it, you know, when the new journal comes out, we have, we scholars have the temptation, gee, we should read every article. Okay. Well, we don't know. I feel, I feel like I'm back in fourth grade and my teacher is standing behind me telling me to read everything because it might be on the test. No, only read what you have to read to solve the problem you're working on now. Back in the old days, before we had PDF, I had a huge collection of paper journals. I still have a lot of them. And uh, I would read every article and underline, make notes in the margin. Sometimes I would pick up a journal that I had gotten in the mail maybe three weeks ago. And there would be an article with my underlining, my notes in the margin, and I have no idea what it was about. I couldn't even read my own writing. It was a total waste of time. The secret is read what you must read to solve the problem you're working on right now. Um, a guy in rhetoric and rhetoric studies uh, found evidence for it. His name is Bazeman. He interviewed physicists there. They're, um, again, this is the days of print journals when everything was there in the library. And he asked them about their behavior in research libraries. He found that they would look at the new journals they certainly didn't read every article. If an article was interesting and was important for them today, they would read it. And very few are like that. He'd make a note <clears throat> of articles I'll look at someday when I turn to that problem. Then you remember it. When I do that, when I only read what I must read, I remember everything. I can even tell you what page it was on, where it fit on the page, where the figures were, it was on the left side, right side. It's like perfect memory. That's because I'm reading to solve a problem. We saw your memory comes from your attempts to solve problems, okay? There's a famous poem that makes the point. Yes. Do you love me or do you not? You told me once, but I forgot. Now the reasons that's nonsense is that you don't forget things like that. One trial is enough, one repetition, because it makes a difference in your life. The telephone rings, it's your cousin. You and your cousin were shopping the other day and you bought a lottery ticket and you just won a million dollars. Your cousin says, we just won. Come on over, I'll give you 500,000, share it. You don't say, who was on the phone? What did he say? One repetition is enough if it solves a problem for you. That's what happens when you read 
narrowly. Now let's go to the actual, the secrets of writing articles. And I have never seen this mention. I want all the credit for this. Uh, I call it the central table hypothesis. You're writing up a paper. I'll tell you what not to do. Don't start with the introduction. Don't go then to the procedure. Then don't go to the methodology, then the conclusion. No, it looks that way when you read it, but that's not how you write. I have learned that every article that has numbers in it, an empirical study, every article with numbers, quantitative, has one central table, period. It's all in one table. And if you're in a hurry, you find that table and you see what happened in the study. So one group drank coffee, the other didn't drink coffee, and you see how much they did, how well they did on a memory test, and you have a two by two table, there's the numbers, the means, the standard deviations, and it's all there, okay? I would find that first and I would write it up first. Once you have written the central table and your numbers are there, the hard work of writing a paper is over. That's the hardest part. Do the central table. When you're finished with that, they're also, they're then not as important, supporting tables. Like how old were the subjects? Uh, how many females? How many males? How much education did they have? Things that may or may not be important in the analysis. That, that's the results section. It's a central table and supporting tables. Then you go to the procedure section. You write out how you did the paper, how you did it, uh, where you got the subjects, uh, what the tests were like, um, et cetera, the procedure. Then the conclusion. Conclusions are, I think we can save the world a lot of suffering if you do it this way. Conclusions always begin with a very short summary of what happened in the paper. Two sentences is enough. We showed that people who drank more coffee do better on a short-term memory test. Okay, maybe, and that's it. Then every paper for some reason in these days has a long apology section where the researchers confess their mistakes and promise never to do it again. Like our study's really not very good. We pretend to be very humble because we didn't randomize, the test wasn't, uh, you know, reliable or low level of reliability, et cetera. So you do all that. I would include that, but don't make it too long. The next one is the longest and the most boring, the next two. The implications of your studies, followed by what people should do in the, in the future. I think we make a terrible mistake by including these sections and making them very long. The implications you don't need those. If you need to know what the implications are, you shouldn't be reading the paper. Only people interested in that area will read the paper. Uh, implications, one of my favorite papers is by uh, Crick and Watson, published in the journal Na uh, Nature. Uh, you can find it on, on, online, they'll download it. It's the discovery of DNA, you know, and the code, genetic code and all that. The paper is probably the most cited paper in history. It's brilliant. Two and a half pages. That's all. Isn't that wonderful? The yes. discussion, the implications, here's the whole implication section. Short, it has not escaped our notice that the pairing mechanism we've postulated suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Now, if you don't understand that, you have no business reading the paper. And if you do understand it, you don't need a long discussion. Then you tell people what they should do next. Oh no, don't insult my intelligence for telling me what the next study should be. I won't read this paper unless I know the field. Anyone who knows the field will know what to do next. And it's their business what they do, not the authors to tell you how you do your research. What is going on here is that people are publishing their dissertations as journal papers, which is a big mistake. So these articles are much too long. Okay, the introduction. This should be obvious now. Do it last. Do not give a history of civilization. Do not tell people every paper you've ever read. Do not do a literature review. That is one of the biggest wastes of time ever, in my opinion. Just tell the reader enough 
so the reader can locate the article intellectually. So he knows what tradition it's being followed from, what previous studies have shown as quickly as possible. If you need details, you shouldn't be reading this paper. So we're gonna save a lot of time. Do the introduction last, only what's important. Uh, I'll come back to this at the end, why we need to write shorter papers in general. Okay, secret 13. When we teach writing, we always tell students, consider your audience. Yes. I say, forget your audience. Don't worry about your audience. They always say, uh, think about what journal you're going to publish in. Forget the journal. Don't even write your paper. Write your paper the way it seems right to you. Then when you're done, you make little changes to make it fit a journal. If you have to do a lot, then it's the wrong place to publish it. Don't worry about the audience. Get your ideas clear so that you're satisfied with them and then make the small changes particular journal gets. So then you set it off to a journal. What happens next? You know what happens, you get rejected, right? Everybody gets rejected. Nobody talks about it. Psychology journals, the APA data, three quarters of papers are rejected. The studies though, this is to uh, cheer you up a little, when top quality papers are rejected, they do get published eventually. Uh, just try another journal, try another journal, um, et cetera. Uh, oh gosh, I, I've been rejected as because I published so much, I've probably been rejected more than anybody in the audience today. Uh, and I just expect to be rejected. Uh, it's normal. And what I do is I immediately make another version I accept the criticisms that I think are right, and I don't accept the ones that I think are wrong. And I immediately send it off to another journal. Now, here's what happens with journals. You write a paper. I, I'm not going to name any names, but I'm talking about the journal Foreign Language Annals, okay? Uh, the American Council of Foreign Language Teaching. Uh, sent them a paper once, and this is typical. They send it to three reviewers. If the only way they're gonna publish, publish it is if all three reviewers love the paper. Otherwise, it's not gonna be. So I wrote this paper, two reviewers liked it. The third reviewer, uh, I thought it was one of the best papers I had ever written. Uh, it was about polyglots and their views of language, uh, language acquisition, what they went through. I interviewed um, Steve Kaufman, who speaks 20 languages. And I had spent time with Lom Kato in Hungary, who also spoke about 18 languages. And I, I had their books and I talked to them, I got their views and I put it all in this one paper. I thought foreign language channels would love it. The third reviewer said, well, it's okay, but uh, krashen has been criticized in the past and he should take some space and answer these criticisms. I wrote back and said, no, that's not what this paper is about. I've answered all of them already. And I'm not going to bore readers and make this much, much longer, you know, just because this one reviewer wants it. So no, I'm not going to do it. They said, well, that's what the reviewer said. You either make the changes or we won't publish it. And I said, then don't publish it. I'm going to talk about this a little later. It's your paper. It's not theirs. If you follow their advice and it's wrong, it's your fault. You can't say the reviewer made me do it. If I had done that, the paper would be too long too awkward, no one would know what it was about, um, et cetera. So I'll come back to this again. You gotta learn to accept which ones are real. I got it published elsewhere, there's no problem. So uh, that's always, it's gonna happen. There are a lot of journals out there. Okay, my next secret, oh, secret 14, expect rejection, don't worry about it. Number 15, um, live in the past, honor our lineage. Only do primary research when you must. Now I'm talking experimental work here. You, primary research means you do a study. You have a hypothesis. You get groups of people. One group does this, one group does that. You see which one is better. You publish the results, um, et cetera. That's called primary research. I have done a fair amount of primary research, but I've learned it's not the best way to do it. 
I want to live in the past. I like to use old sets of data. I'll come to that in a moment. Breakthroughs, progress in science rarely comes from primary research. It comes from secondary research and what we call meta-analysis. Uh, if you do primary research, my advice is try to use other people's tools, try to use other people's data, um, et cetera. Don't reinvent. If you need a test to give your subjects or questionnaire, look at other people's questionnaires, use theirs. Give them credit, they'll love it, okay? So don't reinvent the wheel all the time. And consider doing, using what are called unobtrusive measures. There's a wonderful book, I forgot the name, it's called Unobtrusive Research in the Behavioral Sciences. It's gone through about five editions. You can get even the first one, it's wonderful. Do research, if you must do primary research, do research where you don't bother people. They don't even know that it's an ex experiment going on. I'll give you two examples. There was a car dealer, automobile dealer in Chicago when I lived there, I was a little boy. Um, his name was Frank. His first name was Zachary. So it was called Z Frank. Z Frank for your Chevrolet, okay? Z Frank, Z Frank. And what he wanted to know was where he should advertise on the radio. Someone who wants to buy a Chevrolet, what radio station are they listening to? Now you can do an experiment. You could go interview people. Do you drive a Chevrolet? What are your favorite stations? His idea was brilliant. He had a Chevrolet dealership and part of the dealership was a repair shop. He went into the repair shop and he asked the mechanics, before you repair a Chevrolet, look at the radio dial and see which station it's tuned to. Isn't that brilliant? No work, no invasion of privacy. Those are the stations we want to advertise on. That's called unobtrusive research. I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Nishan Ashtari, uh, finished a study like this recently. I think I'm co-author of this, but she did the work. I got some of the credit. Anyway, uh, she based it on a methodology invented by Jeff McQuillan. Jeff's idea was to see if people really do self-study. There are all these self-study books. Teach yourself French, okay? Teach yourself German. So Jeff went into the library and found all the self-help books. Teach yourself Spanish, et cetera. Fill with exercises. He took them down to the from the shelf and he looked at how many pages the person read as reflected by the wear and tear of the pages. For example, smudges, little pieces of dirt, creases when they turn the page. If 20 people read a book, you can tell which pages were read. He found most of the books, less than 20% of the book was read by anybody. People read the first chapter or so, and then they stop. These books are not a success. Well, Dr. Ashtari was interested in Farsi, language of Iran, as you know, some people call it Persian. Uh, and uh, whether, in, this was a Southern California study. And in Southern California, there are a lot of Iranians in certain neighborhoods, uh, Westwood, et cetera. And there were, uh, until recently, uh, Farsi bookstores, books that had, so first, that had lots of books in Farsi. And she wanted to know whether people were reading them. One of the reasons the suspicion was that children don't know Farsi very well when they get older, they come from Iranian families, there's nothing to read. And that really holds you back. So she did the wear and tear study. She looked at all the Farsi instruction books, took them down off the shelf and saw just as McQuillan did where the wear and tear was. The results were even more depressing than McQuillan's study, something like 5% of the pages were worn, if there's any indication. So this methodology is not very popular. People don't stick to it, et cetera. So my advice, check out unobtrusive research. It's a way of saving lots of time and making life easy for yourself. Related to this in living in the past is the importance of old data. 
I discovered this working, uh, I did my work in, uh, at USC in the education library. It's been converted now into a restaurant. Oh my gosh. And part of the education library when I was there were shelves and shelves of old journals. Very easy to leaf through a journal. And I used to do that during my breaks, just looking to see what they were doing 50 years ago, 100 years ago. I found absolute gold. 1898, 1902, in English language arts journals, I found articles about spelling. Really interesting. One of them came out 1898, one of them, or 1902, one 1897. The one 1902, Kornman's article, was called The Futility of the Spelling Grind. In other words, teaching spelling isn't doing anyone any good. They looked at children in elementary school, lots of grades, and looked at their spelling scores and divided them into some classes where spelling was taught and some classes where spelling wasn't. No difference. The spelling scores were the same whether you had formal instruction in spelling or not. Now, this data was published, you know, 120 years ago. And in those days, they didn't have these statistical tests that we have today. That wall started to be invented around 1920. You know, the T-tests, the correlations, all that stuff. Uh, so my student and I uh, did the statistics because they had published all the numbers. It was really fun. Guess what? They were right. There was no significant difference between the groups that had spelling instruction and those that didn't. That counts as a new discovery, as if we had done it last week. <clears throat> that works. Um, Morris Halley, very interesting guy, is a, a good friend of uh, Noam Chomsky. They worked together at MIT. And Morris Halley worked in phonology, uh, Chomsky in syntax, to some extent in phonology. And they published a book called Sound Patterns of English, which was the work in phonological theory at the time. Uh, Morris Holly gave a, a lecture in which he brought up some very old data, 20, 30 years old, and someone complained, this is old data. And Professor Holly said, I'm not here to give you the news. I'm here to give you the truth. Old data counts. This, that was so exciting, honoring Kornman and Rice for their work years and years ago. I wrote to uh, Kornman's uh, family to get some new data. And they were very excited. I was interested in his stuff, uh, et cetera. Okay, number 16, I have, oh, oh, I wanted to give you one more thing. Simonton, good grief, this is interesting. Dean Keith Simonton, who is a brilliant researcher on creativity, several books and uh, collections of articles. He asked this question in one of his books. When you think of eminent thinkers, when you think of people who are representative of what they call the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. For example, um, we look to Margaret Mead in anthropology as representative of her time when she worked, huge influence. Chomsky, obviously in linguistics, is the spirit of linguistics of the last century and some in great extent of this one too. Would you say that he asked this question, would you say that these eminent thinkers are with the times or ahead of the times? Well, the naive answer is, oh, ahead of the times, they look to the future. His answer was no, none of the above. They're generally behind the times. They're generally interested in ideas that are no longer fashionable, that are no longer popular, that they decide are important very independent thinkers. Chomsky, for example, he's known for his theory of innateness, that certain aspects of uh, language you're born with, like all languages have pronouns, therefore the child will be expecting pronouns. So innateness was a popular idea in French philosophy. Uh, Descartes, all these people wrote about it. Chomsky wrote a whole book called Cartesian Linguistics about the French philosophy of innateness. It's absolutely riveting. He stuck with that and applied it to his linguistic work. So his, in his ways, eminent thinkers are oddly backward looking. They struggle to consolidate the ideas of the past into some grand overarching synthesis. They're not pushing on to other things, things that strike their fancy. 
Well, I've done secret number 16 already. So uh, deal with feedback right away and criticism. Number 17 follows right along here. I just discovered this uh, last week. Very impressed with it. What I do, which I think is counterproductive, I'm confessing, I am easily infatuated. That's a very interesting word. We use, we use it uh, uh, to apply to romance, but it applies to ideas too. We fall in love with ideas and we can't think of anything else. Infatuation is good. It's how we learn things. And you know, all you do is think about this idea, this idea, and you like it so much, you rush off and start working in that area. You rush off, say, you know, I'm fascinated by coffee. So let's say I get the idea that coffee is good for language learning. So I look at all the research and I design an experiment, uh, et cetera. N no, N not a good way to work. Stay with your old research. Don't go running off. Uh, the more successful psychologist in his study is one whose research program seems to concentrate on a well-defined set of interrelated topics rather than spreading out too thin, okay? Uh, another person, uh, the same idea, Walter Cannon, progress is characterized by a natural development from one group of ideas to another instead of a flitting from interest to interest in an inconsequential manner. These are the ones who make a difference. Stay with your area of interest. Your area of interest can be pretty wide, like mine is language acquisition and conscious, subconscious, all this stuff. And I've stuck with it, but I've done papers on first language, second language, children, teenagers, adults, animals, all this stuff. And it still feeds the same research direction, keeps me focused, uh, et cetera, instead of just going off with another idea. Uh, I've done that. I've actually done that. And I regret to this day doing it. My, I had one infatuation with cancer research. There's a um, fruit called apricots. And the idea then was that if you take apricot pits and you grind them up, it is a substance inside that's anti-cancer. So you wanna give people, it's called laetrile. And the uh, cancer researchers think it's hogwash. They think it's not, it's, it's a crazy idea. It's uh, a foolish idea. We shouldn't waste our time. And for some, I met somebody in the gym working out and she told me about this cancer research and I got interested. Mistake, I regret doing this. And I wrote three papers on it and they were published in medical journals, okay? I couldn't stay with it. I had too many other things to work on. I never got very, all I got was my initial paper, the one that was the best says, we shouldn't have given up on this. If we look, maybe there was something going on. A couple of the studies that say Laetrile was no good were not, you know, not well designed, so a little contribution. But had I stayed with that only, I would have done something with Laetrile, but this stuff I'm doing now is what I should be doing. I shouldn't get infatuated and rush off to another area. I wasted three months of work. Other people would have found that, would have found Maybe we lost uh, Professor uh, Krushen. Right?
Okay. Okay, problem solved. Yes. Okay, so I'll continue. Yes, no problem. Okay. Um, I think uh, this is the war I've declared. It has three principles. In my opinion, all scientific knowledge should be available to everybody for free, public domain. Uh, presidential candidate, previous Bernie Sanders introduced that in general, this kind of thinking. Well, right now we're all lo looking for the, uh, for a virus, uh, for the cure for the virus, a vaccine. When it's found, the basic research should be made available in the public domain in knowledge. This, it shouldn't be the property of rich corporations, um, et cetera. Uh, I'm in favor of what we call open access journals. Jur I, right now, we're, we're facing a problem that yes. everyone in this audience has, the professors, the faculty. We can no longer afford to read scientific literature. Unless you work at a first class university library, a university with a terrific library and free access, you're a member of the faculty, you cannot keep up with the research. Uh, journals have become so expensive that I cannot afford to subscribe to them anymore. I have also found that scientific books, collections of articles, etc., are much too expensive. Uh, I realized this in 2007, I think, when I was invited to contribute an article to an edited book called Research, I'm sorry, Input Matters, little play on words. And I wrote an article on input. I had a great time with it. It was really long. I figured this is such an opportunity. I talked about first language, second language. I had a section on animals and I had a section on language from outer space. What happens when the flying saucers land? How will we communicate with them, et cetera? Then the book came out, hardcover, 160 American dollars. This is back in 2007. I couldn't afford extra copies for my family. They give them to my, as gifts to my relatives. The soft cover was just as bad, it was like $65. Uh, the, I don't know anyone who can afford books like this. Textbooks, textbooks are now way up there. Kids have to pay, you know, four or $500 for textbooks. This is insane. So if you read a journal article and it's in a, one of the prestige journals and you wanna get a copy, you have to pay $40. The author doesn't get it. The textbook company, the journal company gets the money. This should not be. Fortunately, there's been a reaction. The war is going very well. A mathematician from the uh, United Kingdom who works in algebraic geometry, winner of the Fields Medal, like the Nobel Prize of Math, declared war against a publisher, against Elsevier. Elsevier published the number one publisher in mathematics. He says, we do the work, we write the articles, we revise them, you guys get all the money and it's too expensive, we can't afford it. He went on strike. He stopped submitting articles to math journals. Everything was circulated in working papers among colleagues. In our field, we have open access journals. As of five, six years ago, I only publish in open access journals. You can find my articles easily. I wrote a paper on this, a short paper proposing we need to write shorter papers. Uh, we, we don't want uh, long articles, we want short articles, I'll talk about that. But we want all of them to be open access where they are free. They're free to the writer and they're free to the reader. You can find mine on my website, um, sdcrashen.com, and in ResearchGate, which will post your article no matter where you publish it. So I've been posting my papers on ResearchGate, giving them away for free. And if you go to Twitter, if you follow me on Twitter, I announce the new papers that I do, my colleague does. Several of my colleagues are doing this. Uh, if you go to backseatlinguist.com, you will find Jeff McQuillan's papers. Uh, BenicoMason.net, you will find hers. So this is more and more people are doing this. The argument against this open access, well, it's not high quality journal. It's not like the New England Journal of Medicine and all this stuff, but it's becoming that way. More and more people are publishing there. 
And if you're on a, let's say a review com uh, committee, it's easy for you to find articles of the candidates. They're right there, open access. I also think, okay, number one, it should be free. I've just saved you lots of money. Number two, short papers. This was implied in my discussion of journal papers before. Keep it short. About five years ago, when I decided to start doing this, I limited my papers to like five pages, shorter if possible. Occasionally write something a little longer, but very, very rarely, only when it's really important, really necessary. And, you know, I get a lot of requests from journals to review articles that scholars send in. And I like doing it. It's uh, part of the rent we pay for being professionals. We have to help our colleagues, et cetera. But about, and I get lots of requests for doing it. And the papers are so long. That's the problem. So I set a new rule. I will only review papers if they're five pages or less. I have not reviewed any papers for any journals in the last five years because they're all too long. That's what's happening to our field. Another uh, problem we have now, articles are too expensive, um, et cetera. They should be available for free and they should be shorter. They're too complicated. They're full of what we call gibberish, nonsense. Uh, they're written to be published, not to be read. They're written to confuse people, in my opinion. So people will think they're smarter than they are. There's another reason. A guy named Hedges wrote about this, and I think this is a brilliant insight. As long as academics write in the tortured vocabulary of specialization for seminars and conferences, they are unable to influence public debate, and they're free to espouse any bizarre or radical theory. If you want your conscience to be clear, if you want to write something you think is absolutely right, but you don't want to be criticized, make it incomprehensible. No one will criticize it because no one will understand you. I, this hit me uh, when I was a graduate student. My, one of my professors was uh, in phonetics. His name was Peter Ladefogad. And uh, he uh, made sure we all went to the acoustical society meetings. And I remember going to Dr. Ladefogad's presentation. And he said, last night at the business meeting, we decided to make presentations shorter so instead of speaking for 20 minutes, I'm going to speak for seven minutes and make it short. He made it so clear because he couldn't go through the long explanations, large vocabulary, big words. He, made, he put up a, 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 a slide and said, this is what I think is happening with form and transitions and vowels. And this is what Morris Halley thinks is happening. And here's the data. And this is why I think I'm right. He got more criticism than anyone at the conference because everybody understood his paper. The other people presenting got very little criticism because nobody could understand it. So people write long, complicated papers full of jargon so they won't be criticized because people don't want to read the whole thing or they won't understand it. They'll go off in different directions. So my view is we make it available for free you write short papers in free open access journals. Life will become so much easier. The time it takes you to read 35, 40 papers and wonder what the person was talking about, you can probably read 10 short papers and learn a lot more. So that's my position. I think it will save the field because then we can read each other's work easily. Review committees who have to review colleagues and see whether they should be promoted or fired will have a much easier time because the work will be short and right to the point. Well, that is my presentation today. That is my sermon. And uh, if we have time, can we do some uh, discussion? If you yes, know. of course. Uh, I actually, uh, I will start by, by a little comments from me if you... Okay. Uh, I have written uh, three uh, three pages for comments. Okay. 
So you mentioned something important. You said uh, stay in your area of interest. For example, you uh, you uh, you were writing about uh, language acquisition. Okay, this is your uh, speciality. Okay, so do you think uh, people or writers fail because they, 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 they write in other areas that are not interested? Uh, that, that they're not write? an expert. It takes a long time to be an expert. That's part of the problem. And if you stay in your area, you can make clear progress going from paper to paper to paper, solving problem after problem. Back in the late 1970s and um, early 80s, what was popular in those days was uh, studies of order of acquisition of grammatical morphemes. Some come early, some come in the middle, some come late. I probably wrote 10 papers on this, 10 different studies. And each one solved a problem, answered a criticism, et cetera. And I could focus on one at a time. And I learned so much. And I think we pushed the field forward. That's what I'm trying to do in everything I do now. Stay with the research, honor what other people say. Don't jump around from one thing to another. Don't get on your bicycle and ride off in three directions at once. Just ride off in one direction. Yes, and it also makes sense if you write about something that, uh, that motivates you, that you love, you, you think you excel in it. Because, uh, of course. yes, because when you write about something, you just, uh, for example, in conferences, uh, you know, people use big words, as you said, uh, just to show off or something like this. Yes. I'm not interested in it. Yes, and that's a problem in conferences. Uh, I attended so many conferences and we found this problem. The research mm -hmm. paper is long and boring, full of citations, full of uh, uh, ideas. Uh, we, we get bombarded with a lot of uh, input. But if it is sh short, as you said, it will be, uh, you know. Right. Point. Yes, exactly. The, the, I think that would help our field. It would help to save time. And if it's open access, we save a lot of money. Yes, open access because they are, yes, free. Nobody can afford professional work now. Nobody. I don't know anybody who can afford to. I see books advertised. They look interesting. They're like $100, $200. I can't do that. Nobody can. Even when the economy was good, we couldn't do it. Yes. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I, I love writing. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I recently uh, wrote some few articles. They are not uh, research articles, just a few articles. What's your advice for, for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, for teachers who would like to develop their writing habits? You said that, uh, that uh, incub incubation is, is, is important. Oh, what's, for what's sure. The best, what's the best advice to find your, uh, your way, your habit? Remember that the first draft of anything is shit. Don't try to make a masterpiece. When you write something down, you'll get more ideas and write short things. Well, I do a lot of, uh, I write for the public. I also write letters to the editor of uh, newspapers, magazines, etc. Nearly all get rejected. That's the way it is. It's like 90% are rejected all the time. I do a little better than usual, but that's a good way of saying things quickly and coming to the point right away. So it's a good exercise. So write for newspapers, tell people what we're doing. The, especially if you're a teacher. Are you still with us? Uh, Nova, do you have any comments? Do you hear me? While waiting for a crash to, to be live again. Just, uh, that's just my question, do you remember it? I will write it to you in the comments on the chat. 
Okay, let's start with the first question. We are waiting for you to, to come back. I'll send it to you in the chat, all right? And we also we have Ashtari. Uh, no, no, Han Ashtari. Uh, do, you, do you hear us? Okay. Hello. So just... Hi. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you? It's good to talk to you. Uh, I know that I've been I've been watching and <laughs> seeing everyone, but very nice to meet you both. Yes. Thank uh, you. Nice to meet you too. Do, do, yeah. do you have any comments about this? Oh, I think I, I I've I've listened to this talk a few times. I think so. Yeah, never the professor is old. back. Yeah. Oh, yes. good, good. Just amazing every single time. Yes, you yes. are. Yes, so good. Okay, Dr. Ashtari has taken over. Thank you, Michelle. Just for... <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no one can take over your session. Um... <laughs> I hope they can. <laughs> on the... okay. we, can't, uh, we, can't, we can't see, no? Okay. Oh, I have to just do my video here. Okay. Okay. There we go. Uh, the other thing too, that a uh, good thing to write about in medical journals, I've noticed that when there's, you know, a breakthrough in medicine and the uh, researchers announce a new drug that is going to clear up your, your uh, skin or something, people will write in doctors and nurses will write in and they say, well, we tried your drug on people with the skin condition. And we did it with 10 patients and eight of them got better. One, there was no difference. And the other had a very odd side effect. This is important feedback. This is what letters to the editor of journals are for. Keep the researchers honest. Tell us how it worked with your students, what was good, what was bad, what the problems were, et cetera. The problem with teachers though, is that they have no time. Teachers are overwhelmed with work and that's always been the case. But we need to allow yes. a little bit of time for professional writing, et cetera. Uh, I think it's writing is also therapeutic. Uh, I'm talking about my experience, especially in poetry. When you write, you feel you feel good about about yourself. Oh yes, no question. Yes, I haven't written any poetry. But song lyrics that counts, right? Uh, you you mentioned the mu musical. Is is it some form of? Uh... Of poems or something? You said that I you, don't you, know. This has been observed by many people. Relationship between language and and music. I have no idea. I have no idea, and I don't know any research on it. But I wouldn't be surprised if there was a connection. No question. They're both yes. universal. Language is universal. Music is universal. Every yep. culture has it. And if you look at research on ethnomusicology you find similar systems, similar scale systems, um, et cetera, in different cultures. Yes, we often uh, hear people talk about uh, bad habits like procrastination. You know, those people don't like procrastination, but, but in this sense, in writing, procrastination is some sort of incubation. It's good for writing. If you know how to deal with it, procrastination is fine if you use it as a strategy. Yes, Put it off. Be. There are certain times when I'm better off procrastinating, like this morning. I am not a morning person. I woke up. I was not prepared to attack my manuscript. I procrastinated. Instead, I cleaned up, cleaned up, organized, checked mail. And then after about 45 minutes, the desk was clean. I had had two cups of coffee. I was awake and things went a lot better. So procrastination delay is a good strategy. You have to inspect your own mental state to see whether you're ready, not force yourself. Yes, uh, for example, uh, your message to, 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 to professors around the world and writers, if you want to write a paper, keep it short and keep it simple and don't yeah. mention a lot of details, okay? And uh, let yourself go. Uh, you said you let yourself go and uh, uh, for example, if let's say that I'm going to write about games, grammar games, okay? Yep. Should I read should I read every paper or most of the papers about games? And then no, here's yes and no. Clear answer, yes and no. First, write down your own idea about games. 
why they should work, why they don't work. First that, then look at what other people say. Most of your ideas okay. will come from yourself. Yes. So uh, it's like a conversation. I should first of all listen to myself and then listen to others and then come up yes. with my own, my own contribution. Well, you'll be very interested in knowing one research result. It's creative people, they've analyzed where their ideas come from. Most of their ideas come from their own previous work, not from other people. So respect your mm -hmm. own ideas, yes. Yes, yes, respect your own ideas, yes. So we, we, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, I have uh, an EFA teacher from Egypt now with me and she has some questions for you. Noah, what's your first question? Okay, you are up. I didn't get it. Tell me. Okay. Sorry, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. I don't know, Mr. Primero, Professor. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, the questions? Please. Uh, no, uh, I, I have a question. I'm a primary English teacher. And I was, uh, so I teach students very young. And I would like to introduce them to this, uh, to the writing, and how do I help them start and develop the writing? I wouldn't worry about it. The phrase I like is, read what you like, write when you must. Writing ability comes from reading, just the mechanics of it. So I would delay it, and they'll want to write on their own, and then it happens. I wouldn't push it at all. They'll be good writers after they've done lots and lots of reading and you don't have to worry. The creative writing should be done in their first language when they're young, of course. I have some of them, they start writing. So uh, is there any advice I can give to these youngsters? Sure, encourage it and leave them alone. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, they'll be writing all <laughs> okay. the time, drawing pictures. And, no bad habits, it'll be fine. The worst thing you can do, as you've probably guessed, is force them to write and make sure it's perfect and correct. That's gonna turn them off completely. Um, yeah, but by the way, too much intervention. Uh, so some teachers like to get involved in everything students do. That's yes. the problem, that they don't uh, let them do. Yeah, you have to let, let acquisition happen. And in terms of writing that comes from reading, people, well, I did write a letter to the editor I wanna tell you about, maybe I mentioned it last time, um, about a very famous person, perhaps at the moment, unfortunately the most famous person in the world, who is a terrible writer and that's Donald Trump, okay? Uh, I, have, <laughs> I have to say something in advance before I start criticizing Mr. Trump. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, president of the United States, 100 years ago, said it is our patriotic duty to criticize the president. If you think there's a mistake, you must speak up. So criticism is patriotism, and it's very important. So I'm following that tradition. Uh, Mr. Trump, uh, as is well known, likes to stay up late at night and uh, tweet to everybody, send his little messages and complain and insult and take credit for other people's stuff, all the things he does. Um, and he makes mistakes, lots of spelling mistakes. And there was uh, a great deal of discussion in the Washington Post about his mistakes. Uh, some people criticized him, some people supported him. People, a lot of people supported him and said, oh, don't worry, these are only spelling mistakes. And all he needs is to use his spell check. And you should stop picking on Mr. Trump, he's okay. And I wrote a letter, which was published, I was amazed. I wrote a letter and I said, spelling mistakes do reveal a great deal and we shouldn't just forget them. Our research at the university shows that people who read more are better spellers. Yeah. Not only when people who read more are better spellers, they're better in everything. They have larger vocabularies, they have better grammar, they're better writers in general, okay? 
Not only that, the research also shows, this is from the University of Michigan, Keith Stanovich, that people who read more know more. They know more about everything. They know more about history. They know more about literature. They know more about science. They know more about practical things. And this is from reading fiction. They also have more mature habits of mind. Um, they, they have a better sense of how human beings are. You know, if you're reading a novel, you become the protagonist of the model of the, of the novel. You face the same decisions. So they understand different people more. And also they realize that solutions to problems are not always the simplest ones. This comes up in novel after novel. Uh, I read an article around that same time in the Guardian from the UK. It was an interview with Barack Obama about his reading habits. And he answered the questions as if he had just read all the research, even though he hadn't. Um, Obama said, I read fiction and fiction has taught me simple solutions don't always work. And you can get along with people even though they seem to be different. You can see the commonalities. It's exactly what fiction teaches you. And my conclusion was that we know Mr. Trump is not a reader. He's proud of it, in fact. And we have all suffered because of this. Uh, I'll send you a copy. You can pass it around. And they actually, so uh, I do think the little mistakes should not be worried about because with reading, they're going to go away. And Trump is certainly old enough. They should have gone away by now. But he misspells a lot of simple things. There's a real problem there, lack of reading. Did you say we, uh, we all suffered because of, of uh, lack of reading? Okay. We all suffer because Mr. Trump is not a reader. Wow. In my opinion, he doesn't know, oh, he doesn't know politics. He doesn't know geography. He was in Israel a few years ago and he was leaving and he says, well, now I'm going to the Middle East. Where do you think you are? You know, that, that kind of mistake. His treatment of the coronavirus, understand, he doesn't understand third grade science and people are dying. I'll That's say this out loud. He's responsible for the death of 100,000 people who have died because of the coronavirus, where they could have taken measures that he did not support in the United States. So this is very, very serious. We need people who read. Uh, compared to, 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 the, to the last, uh, to the previous president, is uh, What a more, difference. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a huge difference. Yeah, Obama, uh, definitely a reader, educated, a lawyer. Uh, a professor of law, um, and clearly someone who tries to understand other people. Uh, my son met Barack Obama briefly. Uh, my, my son was one of a group of 100 young scientists who won awards, and they got to meet the president at the White House and shake his hand. And we were allowed to see several ceremonies, but we didn't see that one. And he told us what it was like to shake hands with Obama. This is important. He said, Obama looks you in the eyes. He knows who you are and he talks to you and he listens to what you're saying. This is lacking from Trump. I'm totally, you can't imagine Trump doing that. He's not, Obama is not self-centered. He's an intellectual and a thinker. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, by the way, we have received uh, so many questions. A lot well, of questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, if uh, maybe you could, if you have time, another uh, another session for this this uh, uh, writing uh, questions. questions. Sure. Uh, yes. We could do that if if you could send me some of the questions in advance. Yes, I will share the questions with you uh, as a Google Doc. Okay. Google Doc. Okay, or just email, whatever. Okay. Yes, I will email the questions, and then you can choose the ones that. Uh, but, uh, you know. The ones I know the answers to, okay. No, <laughs> no, no, the ones that are related to writing because uh, most of them, uh, so, some of them uh, were related to language acquisition. Very good, that's good. Well, I know something. Some of the, some of the questions were related to language acquisition. Uh, not, not uh, okay, but the majority okay, were related uh, to writing. Yes? Okay. What's your next, next question, uh, Noah? No, no, it's not. It's okay. It's gone. Okay, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay. okay. 
Okay, uh, we, we still uh, have time for uh, some questions. For a few questions more, yeah. if it's okay with you, Professor. Um, is there a relationship between uh, first language writing proficiency and second language writing performance? This is asked by Fauzea Abdesalem, a teacher. Okay, I'll give you a clear answer. The answer is yes and no. Um, in terms of the mechanics of writing, not much, especially when the writing systems are so different as is between say Arabic and English. Um, in terms of the composing process, using writing to make yourself smarter, yes. Yes, which is why I say, uh, we don't have to worry about students doing uh, research writing in English right away. Let them build up competence first. They can do their work in Arabic. It's a wonderful idea. Get your ideas together, et cetera. Um, I have published papers in other languages. I generally work with a team though. I don't have to do the whole thing myself and I can discuss the papers and do a first draft, but uh, you know, I'm not native speaker, highly sophisticated. So I get help with the rest of it. So that, that's the relationship. Make a long story short, the idea that you can use writing to make yourself smarter, that is universal. The value of revision, that is universal. That's the important thing. Yes, we have, uh, we have a comment from uh, Mohammed Hassim. Uh, how can we assess papers published in free access journals? How can we guarantee academic, academic quality? Well, the open access journals are refereed, no question. And they're just as well judged as the so-called prestige journal. So I've had my papers you know, commented on, I've had to revise them for open access. This is not just write it and get it published automatically. So the standards are, are pretty good and they're getting better all the time. I think the rate things are going within a few years all publication is going to be open access. Many universities, especially in mathematics where this all began, are no longer subscribing to journals. That's all open access and no longer subscribing to the paid journals. So it's getting to be more and more open access. And if senior scholars like me, old people, if we publish open access, it will soon everybody will be doing it. We have to be the model because we don't, we're not worried about promotion and all that stuff. So we have to do it. So all you other senior scholars out there, do some of your work in open access, help us out. And then I can read it for free. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, uh, we have a question from Dr. Priya J. Uh, elaborate on reading writing continuum. What is, what is the question? Elaborate on reading writing continuum. I would need more detail. I don't know what the... Uh... So, uh, let's move to another one. Please. Uh, this is from Mark Nathaniel. During this pandemic, uh, what possible language research can be done? I'll tell you what I'm doing. <clears throat> um, I'm sitting home reading a lot. I, I'm very influenced by the work of my colleague, Benico Mason who recommends that even for people who think they're pretty good in a language, you need to read lots and lots of easy texts that are not demanding. And I've been experimenting with myself with Spanish. My Spanish is okay. I can have a conversation, it's, it's all right. It's everyday Spanish, not highly technical. So I've been taking my time here at home and I've been reading in Spanish every day, easy Spanish for students graded readers. I found a couple of really good authors and I've been reading in Spanish all the time. You know I'm getting better. I have myself tested once a week. Here's what I do. I go to the local supermarket and I always you know, go once a week for groceries and there's a special time where only old people are allowed, so that's good. And when I check out, when I pay for my groceries, I always get the same person. I make sure it's Fidel. Fidel is Mexican American. His Spanish is perfect. He's born in Mexico. His English is good too. His Spanish, his native speaker is Spanish. At first, I spoke Spanish to him and he answered in English. And I said to him in Spanish, I said, my goal is to speak Spanish as well as you do. 
And he said, okay, I'll help you. And once a week I go in, I have a conversation with him. And I've noticed I'm getting better because when he talks to me, he now speaks faster. He uses more complicated language and he'll make some jokes because he can sense that I'm getting better. I don't improve from talking to him. I improve when I listen and I improve when I read. So this is my research. I think that it's important for people like us who are langu in language teaching to be always trying to acquire other languages. Some languages I'm pretty good in, some I'm kind of in the middle and some I'm terrible. And I try to get the feeling for what it's like to acquire a language by doing it myself. And at home, it's through reading. It's easy to do in Spanish because I can find books in Spanish. Other languages, it's quite tough. It's very hard to find texts in other languages. That's the main problem. But I'm working on myself. That's my research right now. And doing my regular papers, which are consists of other people's research. By the way, I, 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 I am preparing comic, uh, Arabic uh, comic uh, books. In um, Arabic? Yes. But I know, you, you have to understand, I know nothing. Yeah, but yeah, but you will you will learn. I'm sure about this. Okay, I do. I know Hebrew to some extent, and I know Amharic from Ethiopia. So that gives me some shared vocabulary, but not much. So it's up to you, my friend. Yes, <laughs> you will understand some expressions like greetings, like uh, uh, you know, fa famous expressions, not uh, idiomatic okay. expressions. Okay, I would love to learn the script. And I would love to acquire some Arabic. That would be great. No, I will send you the comic books. Uh, I, I'm just uh, choosing the right ones for you. Excellent. Love it. Absol That's cool. Absol absolute beginners. Good. That's me. As you said. Yes. Okay. Shukram. Uh, the, uh, oh, here is a, a new word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe you can take uh, three more questions. Sure. Three more is fine. Okay, Noah, do you have another one? Um, our, uh, there is uh, one from uh, Tyra Amin. Uh, our research focus is constantly developing. How do we demonstrate this evolution in, uh, in thought of our follow-up journal papers? Well, that's a good point. The journal papers that we write cannot all be 100% original new things. Replication, 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 extremely important. A good place to begin is to replicate someone else's study. The journals are not very friendly toward it, but it's very important. Let's say you have a paper where you do an experiment and you find it significant at 0.05 level and you replicate it. That means it's significant at the 0.025 level. It makes the result more reliable, more powerful. And in replication, what you can also do is make slight changes each time and confirm hypotheses, small hypotheses as you work. I learned this when I was a student of John Uller, O-L-L-E-R, and he did study after study on testing. And very carefully, each study made small changes, small changes. The papers were short and easy to read. And I quickly became an expert on testing theory by reading his work. And he did a lot of good for the field. That's the model. So and check it out, great. do replication. That's great. Um, okay, well, yes, well, we still have two questions. It's okay, guys. Okay. So uh, a question from Kate, uh, uh, are there different styles of templates that you recommend for different types of publications, uh, publication articles, conference proceedings, manuscripts, book reviews? In templates, no. What you do is you first write your article without thinking of any journal. Forget the templates. Yes. Write it as it feels right to you. Then find a journal that publishes in your style and make the minimum changes. Don't use a template, don't use someone else's format. Let the material, the ideas dictate the form. Okay, Much easier. 
great. The ideas should dictate the form. Yep. yep. Not the form dictate the ideas. That's right. And there are plenty of journals. You'll find one. You, you see where other people publish. See the ones. Look at my, my work and see where I've published. Look at sdcrashen.com. In the last few years, it's been mostly open access journals. Try those. I publish in journals in India, in Turkey, all over the world. Make new friends. You don't have to go to the same ones. By the way, as a quick comment to your uh, writing style, uh, you know, I, I love the way you, 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 you write. Uh, every, word, every word serves a purpose because uh, I read uh, all the uh, papers that you sent me. They are Good. very short, brief, simple, to the point. Well, people do that in fiction too. I learned that from Kurt Vonnegut who talked about fiction writing and it applies to us as well. He says, don't waste any words in fiction. If there's a gun hanging on the wall, you have to use it in the story. No extra description that doesn't push, everything has to push the story along. Same thing in writing scientific work. Don't just put something in because you feel like saying it. You can use it in another article. That's fine. But people wander yes. off. Yes, yes. Okay. So maybe we will, uh, uh, you know, schedule another meeting for the questions that I told you. Sure. That'd be fun. Okay. And then you can, uh, as I told you, to choose the one that related to writing. Okay. Yeah, that's Why fine. Why not all, Aziz, please? <laughs> we need to hear your other things, your other yes. hypotheses and the others. So if it's okay with you, Professor, would you please answer as much as you can? <laughs> I will do my best. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for, uh, uh, for this uh, great meeting. Okay, and I would like to say hello to someone in the audience. Hi, Ilya, can't wait to see you next time. Okay, he'll understand that. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's, That's a friend of mine. Oh, okay, yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for this great session. Every time we meet you, we learn a lot. Oh, good. I'm happy. Thank you. You are a huge source of knowledge, and uh, I am not uh, flattering or something. This is this is uh, the truth. Okay, more to come. You know how it is. Thank you so much. So I will uh, prepare the questions and send them to you, inshallah. Great. Excellent. My pleasure. And I'll wait for the comic books. Okay. Yes, yes. I will send them to you, inshallah. Okay. Shukran, Habibi. Good. Talk to you next time. Yes, thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.